Hey, welcome back everyone to Comerit's What's Up Enterprise, where we explore the latest technology trends across industries with leading experts from around the globe. Today, I have a couple of really special guests. Kara Burke, who some of you might remember from an earlier um, interview that we did. She is one of our top um, engineers here at Comerit, and she's got a special guest here, Tony, with over 30 years of technology experience and, you know, Tony, you come from a, a big iron shop from the past, right? You have some, I think Gateway is a fairly big, big or organization to have come from prior to starting your own thing. But I won't yeah. go too much in your details. What I'm going to do is um, I think you, there's a great relationship you all have together. And I'd like you guys to just kind of explain your background. We'll start with you, Tony. Sure. Thanks, David. Um, I... Uh... I actually started out of school at Zenith, Zenith Data Systems. Ah, you know, okay. Zenith back then was known for radios and TVs, and they kind of started the Skunk Works division for computers. So Zenith was out of Chicago area, and they start. They, it was almost like a Boca Raton. It was, it was uh, St. Joe, Michigan, just a small group, and that was really cool. I, I worked there for 13 years, and we were we were we almost came up with the PC. Uh, our, our management, I'll say this now, they were kind of wimps. They they knew IBM was coming. They didn't want to come out first. We had we had some great stuff, but uh, we ended really? up then we came out with some computers, and then we ended up you know being like everybody else in Cologne and the IBM PC. And uh, but yeah, Zenith was like was actually like huge in the in the PC business. Nobody knew it because most of their sales went to like the government. So it was like just oh, massive, wow. you know. Yeah, it was pretty. Uh, and 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 so then after that, I, I went to I went to work for Gateway. Um, while I was at Zenith, we were analyzing Gateway, and Gateway was just fast and nimble, and they had low costs. And I remember some of the the business guys were saying that this is this is impossible. They must be just trying to buy business, you know. And <laughs> and I you know I, I kind of analyzed it myself. I was like, yeah, I think they're doing really good. I'm going there, you know. So yeah, I went to Gateway, well, and I was the vice president of engineering, product development, kind of advanced technology. And yeah, what an exciting place! Fast paced, great people. Uh, yeah. Real quick before we move on though, Kara, I don't know if you were around when Zenith was out. So I'm old enough. I'll date myself. We used to have this big Zenith TV. Did you have one of those? Where you click the dial? There we was had like, some Zenith products. Uh -huh. Really? We're big too. And it was, was this it big case. A big console with huge speakers on each side of the. Yeah, yeah the I had that. <laughs> it was wooden. That thing was fantastic. We'd all gather around on, on the Zenith Friday nights and watch Twilight Zone and uh, what was the other? Feature Creature. Is that what it is? Creature Feature. Oh, yeah, I remember that. That's Something right. like that. Yeah, 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 the Creature from the Black Lagoon. I don't know. It was really fun. But I did not know that they uh, went, you had a computer, you know, front to them. I, I, I didn't know anything about it. I really thought they were just TVs. I used to even sell TVs, Zenith. When there were still tubes, but they were plastic. Anyway, so I thought I'd bring that up here because <laughs> it's kind of fun. But uh, but yeah, so Tony, so today though, very interesting background. You've got a big data science background, plus also some background in behavioral science, and I think you have an interesting take around how um, what you guys do for companies. And also what we'll end up doing as a whole in terms of organizations that consume technology to help them optimize what they do in terms of business. So I'll let you shoot. And yeah. uh, Kara, feel free. Don't, you, at any time, feel free to interrupt me because if you just okay. let me go, I'll go. But I'll just keep going. So you got it. <laughs> yes. So, so let me give you a little bit about how, you know, why did I even leave Gateway? Because Gateway was great. I, I yeah. thought I was going to live the rest of my life, retire from Gateway, you know, in a gazillion years. And what ended up happening was it was it's it's, it's weird now it, looking back it's kind of funny it's so sad. Um, Gateway used to do like a million computers. Every one could be different, right? Coming down the line, every you know different configuration of hardware, different load of software. It was amazing how we could how we could pump out custom order computers at that volume. And they were they were a little more expensive in in the sense of from the type of computer. And Ted Wade ended up buying e machines. I don't know if you guys remember e machines, but they were yeah, really kinda, a low yeah, cost. I kind of do remember that. They were kind of known for, uh, they would do like a million computers exactly the same. It would come over on a ship from Asia and, you know, go into the stores of the various electronic guys. 
and they were known for like rebates. Like the computer would be like pretty cheap and then you get like a $200 rebate or something like that. It was kind of crazy. So it seemed like the mesh was going to be really good uh, because, you know, high end kind of boutique customized, you know, very powerful computers. And then this sort of, you know, kind of entry level. And so uh, Gateway at the time was like 26,000 people. And uh, e-machines was like 129. Yeah. So so uh, Ted put the guy who was in charge of e-machines over the whole new kind of combination merger thing. And I and I met him and I, and I kind of like, uh oh, I could tell we were gonna be we were gonna tend to be like a 129 size person company. And and kind of that was where like, okay, you know, uh, that's where the idea D2 came. Like, you're gonna outsource us anyway. Why not be friendly about it? Oh. Let us form a company and do all the things that you're going to try to get somebody else to do because you know you're not going to be ready for the American market like, you know, coming out of Taiwan or Hong Kong or, or you know, mm -hmm. and, and being, being mainland China. So it was, it was very amicable. And, you know, Gateway was our first customer and oh, wow. we kind of formed our, our four pillars. It really was about taking the product and get it ready for the U.S. market. But it was, That's really cool. you know, we do global communication, data analysis, behavioral science and and IT, we used to call it engineering, uh, but we scared a lot of companies <laughs> because they were like, "Oh no, they're going to take over our engineering." So, so it, it's it is IT, it really is IT. But yeah, that's so that's kind of how how we came out and we started with. Although that was twenty years ago, we started with everybody that was in the company it was from Gateway. You're like, well, we're all in oh, there. Wow, all there. So let's go do something new. You know, that's and actually kind of a really uh, wild story. I'm going to step back just a second so we can tell us, Kara. So, how do you and Tony know each other? This, oh I think yeah, the same. so. <laughs> um, I grew up in a gateway household also, um, and my what? family moved to Sioux City um, for gateway, and Tony's family and my family lived in the exact same townhouse, like the same did one. They, we did the gateway do that on purpose? Guys. It was like a duplex, you know, the, yeah. the building's attached, you know, so. Uh-huh, yeah. yeah, and um, Tony has a son, Josh, that's the same age as me, and we were best friends. And oh, um, awesome. our families have just stayed friends over all these years. So, um, you know, the Olsons are always invited to all of our family functions and events. And, you know, it's just. That's pretty wild. Friends. So, Tony, did you know <laughs> that Kara would eventually become this data engineer and like have this background? Like, <laughs> could you tell that from when you, you've known her for a long I, time? I have. I've known her. Yeah. Since she was like, what, like two or three years old, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I kind of yes and no. I didn't know she was going to be a data engineer, but I, I mean, she was, I could tell she was something special. I mean, she was very intelligent, very observant. I mean, intelligent, also very athletic. I mean, she was like, like whatever oh, she set her right. mind to was like, whoa, this, <laughs> this girl's got it, you know, got it going on. So I knew she was going to be something big, do something with her big brain. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah. It's funny. Cause we just recently, or I think recently, Kara, you explained to me that you had that fitness background, that somewhere, mm -hmm. a similar background, it, how I got involved in the technology. Well, yep. not how I got into technology, but the fact that I came from a fitness world, I lived in, in that world. I played soccer my whole life. And, and then I find out that Kara was a very competitive, you know, also in her sport. So tell us a little bit about that real quick, Kara, because I, I missed that on our last me? interview. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sure. I'm no, trying to um, translate. How did you go from that to what you are today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I competed gymnastics pretty much my whole childhood. Um, and um, yeah, I traveled around. I had hopes to compete in college, um, ended up getting hurt and, you know, just had a really hard time coming back after having two knee surgeries. Um, continued to run track and, you know, maybe had some potential there, but it just, What'd you, run in, of, was, huh? uh, What'd you run in 200s track? Huh? Uh 200s and 400s. Okay. So those mm -hmm. those were my things that I hated. Like I'd have to hide. <laughs> so the coach would be like, so everyone was starting to hide when the 400 or four by four hundred would come around. And like most of the sprinters, right? We're 100, 200 meter guys. But you ask us to run the 400 and, and your heart just goes, oh no, I got to do that 400. That's a great, <laughs> I don't know how you guys did that thing. That yep. that was a that was a Literally, I would have to run and hide, and they would find me though, anyways, and say, "No, Caspilla, you got to run this thing." I could, I think I could only run like a, a fifty-two if I was like really gonna kill myself and like almost pass out through the the finish yeah. line. So, but That's, were you also one of those? What's that? 
that's the kind of race it is. It's it's, um, it's crazy. You know, it, you know the um <laughs> so track and field started up I think this weekend. And I, I didn't get a chance mm -hmm. to watch it, but that's starting to come up again. But, uh, but back to the gymnastics, could you do like, what was your event? A uh, balance beam. Oh man. So that's yep. like, so we're well, going to talk a little bit about balance here today yep. <laughs> a little bit, but that's that thing. You know, my, my granddaughter, she goes to a little, she's only, she's not even two, but we take her to a gym that has a balance beam on there and stuff. And I yep. try to walk on that thing, just like walk on it. And you guys were like doing flips and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So is that how like that precision, like to be able to do a backflip and land on that thing, did that help you as you moved into like technology? How did, how did they? Probably. I mean, I, I was done competing around 14. That's when I had my knee surgeries. Wow. Um, and, but I, I, started coaching pretty soon after that. So I stayed involved in the sport all the way through college and graduate school, coaching and judging. Um, it's been a big part of my life. And at one point I thought I would just continue to coach and open my own gym. And so I first started studying exercise science. So I got that first degree at 20 years old in exercise science. Um, thinking yeah, I was that's gonna right. So we are, our degrees are the same. Mm-hmm. We, yep. we have the, they, literally the same. I went to UC Davis, got a, a degree in exercise science. It's yeah. Pretty wild. Yeah. Which, and, which is why um, we're in data. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I ended up going back to school and getting my math's degree and studied mathematics in graduate school. Um, and that's no, where I, I started to learn how to code. Um, I couldn't do any so, of that, yeah. Tony. <laughs> and from there, it just continued. So, so, but. so Tony, you brought up this thing about. I, which I believe is a really interesting topic, right? So we have these different generations now coming into the work, the workforce. And simultaneously, we also, you, you watch the history of us go from the, the first PCs. And then here we are now on these, our phones are supercomputers, yeah. but we're past that. Now we're like now talking about data, uh, data science, behavioral science, artificial intelligence. And so I just want to ask this to both of you guys, but I want to get Tony's background because, you know, Kara's background, she came from fitness. I came from fit from a exercise science. All these things actually in my mind come together in how artificial intelligence is coming together on our, in today's world in terms of how will we will, we will deploy artificial intelligence to help with things. Maybe people are, they're no, no longer uh, physically able to do things. That's one aspect of it. The other is just, you know, automating stuff that goes really around um, manual type of things, as opposed to, you know, we can give them the real manual stuff to regular people, but for us now we can stay in the creative, use our physical body and do things and, that's kind of the way I see the world. There's in, in my mind, things are changing every 30 seconds. And every time I look up, I see a new, a new post about here's where big enterprise can go, but they're going to need people like the type of resources that you bring to the table, the type of um, engineers and thought process that you have, because you watched historically how we got from the, from where we were in the, in the past to where we are today. So I wanted to get your insight around this and what you're thinking um, is going on. And then I have some follow-up questions for that. And yeah. Kara, like I said, if you let me, I'll take over the whole conversation. Yeah. So <laughs> don't do that. So I, I think uh, it, it is exciting for me because uh, I mentioned I was, I was in on the early part of the PC. So uh, computing was going from centralized data centers out into the into the masses you know it, certainly the workers and then actually even individuals and obvious at home uh, all over and it was it was a radical shift i i think uh ai is is a similar probably going to be even a greater shift it, it, we are at a massive inflection point that i think is going to it's going to touch every industry eventually it's going to touch every company uh i think like what happened, I was talking to uh, one of the guys here at D2. Is a uh, uh, he, he's even older than me, believe it or not. He he's a graphics artist, and he he used to do stuff with pens and brushes. And and uh, when the PC came, 
he he he, loved, he adopted it very quickly. But he said a lot of the people around him were almost like, "That's I can't use that. It, it, it's almost sacrilegious. This is art. We're creating beautiful art, and we have to use our hands and our brushes." And and talking to him, it was very interesting because he made the transition. He loved it. He saw how it could make him be much more productive, uh, create more volume, more precision, all that kind of stuff. But he said a lot of people, they, they would not touch it. They refused to do it. And within a few years, they were off doing something else because you, you had to take, if you wanted to be, I mean, if you want to do fine art and personal art, that's different. But if you want to do commercial art, you had to go, you had to adopt to the PC. And I, I think that uh, it, it's going to be the same thing with generative AI, it's going to be everywhere. People, and I, I know right now a lot of people are extremely afraid of it. It's going to take my job. It's going to do stuff better than me. It's going to, you know, and, and as opposed to thinking like, like he did when he was a young graphics artist, this is a huge opportunity for me. I think that's the way we got to approach this. You know, it's funny is I was just thinking that too, because we played this uh, board game last night and it was so funny. We couldn't stop laughing. It was I literally, my everybody's ribs were hurting so bad. <laughs> we we're playing this group called Coup. Have you ever heard of the game Coup? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a little bit like Dungeons and Dragons or something like that, but but more to it. And it's, it's you know, I, I I couldn't explain the game, but what caught my attention was the fact that on the box itself there was some some art, and I thought that art okay, I can tell it was drawn by an artist. But I could do that right now on my cell phone. I'll just punch in like, here's what my game is about. And I want these really cool looking characters that represent like spy and coup. And literally I can get an image within under 30 seconds. That's happening, right? That yeah, So I, I understand. It's like, man, you know, um, I, I would tell my friends that, that are artists. I said, listen, um, it this is happening and I, and I watched them use there's other tools out there that they use now that they can use uh just prior to where ai could do all this stuff i can't remember what the name of the artist but unreal engine 5 is one of them so they still draw in unreal engine 5 and you get this really cool art that's really good for like apple vision pro and stuff like that but now like literally i can create a whole city just by texting it in my prompt create a city with characters. So I, I, I do see where, you know, if I'm an artist and I love to draw, but now I'm like, I just love to create. I think the one thing that people can remember or remind themselves is this will free them out, free their minds to really just now create, let the hard stuff be laid out. Let the AI do that, but just use your mind to create. And I'm going somewhere with this because I think, where people are nervous about this, Tony, I really think this is an opportunity for us as humans to optimize through our creativity. There are things that we can just let the AI do, but if we can help people just start to think of how can I, okay, I don't have to waste time doing this manually anymore. Now, can I be creative in what I do, you know, for the company? I think you know, organizations, companies out there can really start to focus on things like that. What are what are your thoughts? I completely agree. I think that, um, especially, I mean, if the people there may be, we're using graphics art as an example, but it's so many different types of things. But for example, if there's a maybe an art director where they kind of get the major flow and they start handing it down, and someone is replicating it, maybe it's a a book, or maybe it's going to be scenes and animation, whatever. Um, the, the, the people that are just kind of mundane, redrawing, 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 those kinds of things, yeah, AI is going to do that better. But it's going to enable them to step up and be, like you said, more, look at the, the bigger, how can I make this better and not just spend my time mm -hmm. doing replication? I, I think That's it's very similar, to, very similar to robotics, where robotics came into the factory and you had one poor slob, you know, 15,000 times a day with a screw, you know, zzz, zzz, <laughs> zzz, you know, that, that, it, it had to be mind numbing. I never had to do that, you know, thank God. <laughs> but but to, to free that person up to do something bigger and better, if, if they would accept it that way, you know, mm. if they if they like doing it, well, then they're kind of out of a job, you know. But yeah, I, I absolutely think it gets rid of the mundane and, and well, allows yeah. us to do more. And so, the scalability, right? 
like yeah, yeah. now in like what you said you don't have to sit there and redraw the same thing over and over again try and make it look perfect like the one before technology is already doing that for you and you can put it on all kinds of products so you can use it as a logo on some profile but you could also get it printed on a coffee mug you can get it printed on a t-shirt you can do all kinds of things with the same piece of art without having to have somebody redoing it and recreating all of these different versions of it to fit whatever product you're trying to put it on. Yeah. yeah. Can I take a moment to just plug something? I was thinking about this while you were talking. So Comerit's doing something really interesting around this also, and it, we call it core. It's Comerit optimized reporting engine right? it's really a part of a brainchild from kara and some others here and um, i i think that's interesting right because we're also looking at how as data engineers as people who focus on knowing that data is, as your foundation is critical before you can deploy some of this gen ai stuff um, we think though the problem is like, I know people want to use AI and we're going to talk about that a little bit, but you have to be able to get your, your baseline foundation in quickly. Otherwise the AI pass you, there's, we're going to be on to the next. So we've come up with something called mm -hmm. core that basically help companies quickly reach some foundational level so they can start to deploy, um, these AI or advanced analytics. Um, and Kara, if you have anything to add, but that's, I wanted to add that because I think mm -hmm. it's kind of relevant in terms of like, even within our own space, that there's going to be automation. That's it's not art, but but we, maybe we can think of new problems and solve for new problems. Once your your base foundation set, you can deploy some um, some of this AI. So, anyways, I wanted to run that real quick because I thought, oh, this is actually something related directly to Kara. Did you have any? <laughs> Other comments on what core is all about? And sure. Yeah. I mean, every company I've worked for struggles mm -hmm. with their basic data foundations, right? We, you hear from the top, oh, I want AI, I want machine learning, I want predictive analytics, I want, you know, everything that encompasses that modern technology. And it's not doable or it's not helpful because their base data is not good. There's no quality to it. There's no structure to it. It's just kind of all out there in the universe. And you can't run a model on something if you don't know what's what's good and what's bad. Um, and so that's what Core is aiming to do is to help get that foundation in quickly, because otherwise these companies spend years and years and years and years and years trying to get their data set up. And by the time they even get close, we're on to the next thing. And um, they never really get to reap the benefits of those modern technological advancements. So by getting in there and getting that data clean and ready to go and ready to feed these models, they're ready to scale every time something new comes up. Exactly. See, Tony, you were right when you recognized there was something special Kara was going to do. <laughs> we're just scratching the surface. Now, you recently went to CES, and I, I wanted to – would you be willing to tell us what you saw there and, and sure. what, what, yeah. What, so what do you think's going on there and anything so, interesting we should be aware of? Oh yeah. I, I've been going to CES for <laughs> decades and, and this is the first year I thought, you know, it, it actually is misnamed. Um, it, <laughs> it really is only maybe 50% consumer. There's a lot of business foundation. Really? Stuff there. Absolutely. And the, the E is for electronics. I mean, it, it's uh I'll come back to that in a second. And then a show, it, it, it's really, it, it's kind of a conference. It's kind of a carnival, you know, it's kind of a, a, a core base sort of showing things in the lab. So, but the E, uh, I, I would say it, it should have been C-A-I-S. Everything was about AI. One of the keynotes, the, the, <laughs> I think the main keynote, you talk about it being consumer electronic show, was L'Oreal, a beauty oh, product wow. co company, right? Yeah, they have nothing to do with electronics, right? But but why why were they there? One, they are about consumers that you know they but they are using they they were talking about how they're using data and how they're using AI to be able to more deeply understand their customers, the different types of customers, to be able to create an understanding of them, communicate with them, create products for them. It's uh, it was like wow, this is fabulous. Just at first, you know, because I'm a guy too, you know, and I'm like, holy <laughs> hell, I'm like nothing but that. But then I, <laughs> when I started to look at, it, I'm like, whoa, this is absolute. This is wonderful, and, and it was everywhere. Every 
every every building, every pavilion, AI. It was it was the it was the hot topic. So, I, I would imagine like you would you know, I would think that that's how it would be. Um, I was really hoping that Apple actually came out with their AI, but I think there's something special they're they're creating. Well, if we have time, we'll save some time on this to talk about the Apple Vision Pro and what your what your thoughts of. I you may or may not have seen it in person, but was there anything else that was a really cool thing that you saw at CES? Um, if I could jump back to Apple for just a minute, okay, sure, go, we'll go I, for I, Apple, I, <laughs> but not not new. I I want uh, going back. I think Apple launched modern AI with Siri in their phones. I, I don't know. That, I think that's clear. That was very public. I mean, there's not, yeah. nothing unusual about that. Everybody knows that. But but it, it took it from being the interaction became more human, right? We spoke into our phones and our phones spoke back to us. Mm -hmm. And it didn't give us this massive thing like, okay, here's here's a million things. Figure out what you want. It told talk to us, gave us, and we asked if, asked for something. It gave us an answer, and I think they were way ahead of everybody else. I I, I think I, I don't know this part. I don't know. I'm guessing. One of the things that was happening with AI, which was very rudimentary, like you remember the chat bots, like you'd you'd ask mm -hmm. a question, you type at something, and it, it was like half wrong, and it didn't <laughs> like. Well, what am I wasting? Like, why can't I get a human being? You know, yes. um, Siri made a a jump in that not only did it understand us, but it, it gave us very thoughtfully applied answers back and, and, and normally very correct. And I, I think, I, I, don't, I, can't, again, I can't say this for sure, I think that the fundamental shift Apple made, which was just brilliant, is they went from having training their models in a kind of a structured, supervised way. Here's the kind of question you're gonna get, let's see the answer you're gonna get. Here's another question, here's another answer, very structured but also very limited because you, it, it could only learn as much as you can respond, give it questions. I think what Apple did, and I think what everybody's, what's happening now, I think ChatGPT was the next one to kind of explode. They didn't train on questions. They trained on massive data sets, learning the language and being ready to make the association to any question. They didn't give it any questions. So I think it was unstructured, unsupervised, which is like, Boom, there's no limit anymore now. You don't have to you don't have to give it, you know, you give it 10 questions, 20, 100. It's like whatever, you know. I I and I, I don't I'm giving them credit and I, I don't know that I should, but I think that's what they did. I think they made that fundamental shift of saying we're going unstructured, unsupervised, let's go, let's see what happens. Yeah, I think you know, this really is cool. great. First of all, I'm having a ton of fun, Tony. I really appreciate this. And you know, most of the time our our uh, podcasts go about 30 minutes. I mean, people, you know, there's a lot people are having to do it in a day. So I try to be very respect, respectful. I think we scheduled more to, on this call, just knowing that this, this, um, <laughs> our topics may go a bit around, you know, but you brought up a really good topic that I'm super interested in. So, um, I think, uh, that Apple, they didn't really play up the whole point. The fact that that Siri is, AI, like they, I mean, they brought up yeah. Siri, and yeah, there's this interface stuff, and um, but they've been really, really quiet, you know. Of, I mean, to some degree, you know, they launched Apple uh, Vision Pro, which is, which is amazing in itself. When we'll we'll save some time for that, but I was um, right now, like the big thing that is has come out, and you'll see very shortly with Google's Gemini, their 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 latest version. Um, Azure's um, basically open AI, right? The co-pilot SAP, which is using SAP Jewel, um, Watson X, there's different things, but what's interesting, I've always, I've been trying to do this for the last six years with Apple was I need, I want an AI to look and look at and analyze how I work throughout the day. Because I know that I could be way more efficient, but someone who could sit there and just analyze what I was doing vocally, texting, email, and literally, I only use Apple. So they could launch this and they would have this opportunity where I, I would just come in there and say, okay, Siri, what should I focus on right now? And just be super highly optimized in terms of, all right, and Siri comes back and says, well, I noticed that you have over 400 emails, but really only two or three need to be answered now. 
perfect. Okay, let me just, which ones? That's how I'd like it to do. And then it's like, oh, you have this podcast coming up here. Yes, I've analyzed your guest, Tony Olson. And here's a couple of things that I would bring up. Okay, perfect. Because that's coming up in five (laughs) minutes. You know, and then (laughs) as that's ending, Siri comes back on and says, okay, you you earlier mentioned that you're going to be calling these uh, employees back. So make sure you leave time because you, I could see that you typically leave the house and grab lunch at this time. That's honestly like, it seems creepy. That's the interaction I want it to have. So I want Siri to come back and say, yeah, you know, I know you're roughly good. What's that? (laughs) That's actually brilliant. Especially because people that use Apple, all of their products are Apple. I'm an Android user, so I don't quite have the same footprint in terms of like the hardware I have, but people who are Apple users have the Apple phone the MacBook, the iPad, the Apple Watch, the, you know, the Apple Pen, like all of those things. And now the Apple, Apple Vision so it's Pro. It's tracking everything, everything that you do throughout the day. And it's probably listening to you too, whether or 100%, not. 100% all day long. <laughs> no. It's like, hey, I, I signed the agreement. So I know you're listening. <laughs> What do you, you know, think I, about this? Tony? I, I, I love it. I, I think you both said something really important, different. I, I, I like, let me, since Kara just said, let me respond to hers. The idea of a connected ecosystem, I think, is for, for a person, I think is huge because it's going to cut across your daily habits. It's going to cut across your medical habit. Like you, you're wearing an Apple Watch, you can start oh, yeah. saying, Hey, your your pulse is starting to rock a little bit. Maybe sit down or <laughs> cut off the coffee or you know, or and actually feed some of those things to to your dog. Get up, take a break, walk around a little bit. Mm-hmm. I think all of, starting to know you more and respond to you, which was back the original idea of Siri. Even though everybody had it, it was your phone, your Siri responding to you specifically. I, I think, and as more of those different tools are connected to each other, can they feed to your doctor? You know, can they? Can I? Yes, I think all that's going to happen. I, and I like what you said, David. I, I really believe that the the biggest value of of generative AI is is going to be what what I call little L local language models. I think that driving something locally and figuring something out locally, whether it's whether it's specifically looking at at you and your habits and and talking to it about what you want it to do, or small companies looking at you know, like where are they wasting time and where's where's money leaking out of the business or you know, I, I think uh, I think that is going to be hugely important uh, across across AI. So I think both of those things are really good. I, I'm right there with you. I, yeah, yeah. I, I just I know because of the way Apple's built, it, it should be able to do this. I just don't want to wait that long because and then like I could say like toggle a switch saying I need you more active to help me be more efficient, or you can be less active. Like mm-hmm. I don't need that much control. I mean. I don't want you to have that much control, you know, give me op- give me three options and stuff like this. Did you see when you were at CES, Tony, that rabbit R1 uh, device? Did you? I, I heard about it. I didn't see it. I, okay. I, yeah. So that's an interesting concept too, I think, because it uses uh, LAM, which is basically an action model. So the theory that we have these iPhones or we have these Androids and they have lots of apps, the apps actually de-optimize this because you got to go find the app you tap and it, then it you're you're you um click on the little arrow to get your options you scroll click on that so all of those are considered actions that r1 can take those actions now so this is what's interesting what i think is going to be coming where you don't you don't have to look at your phone i'm just going to now tell it what to do like hey can you figure out the best trip for me i have to go and visit my client out in um, Hawaii and Siri knows and analyzes where I tend to spend my time, where I rent it, all that stuff. And then it, it will go through all the clicks and send me back and say, do you want to confirm this itinerary? So with R1 did a demo like that, but apparently live, it's not working quite that well, but the concepts there, like they, that's what they're going after. I think I can't remember which AI they're going to uh, launch with. It might be Anthropics, but the next step is so Siri's giving me this guidance, but also I believe Apple's where because I know within their Vision Pro you can make clicks. It knows you're going to click just based on your eyesight. 
So like you're starting to, you look at something and it's like, I could tell that person wants to open those, that down, uh, the down arrows. I don't know if you guys have watched some of these, uh, Apple vision, uh, videos. They are incredible. W what I like the most is cause I kind of lo like, if you look at my, I have three major screens and I have, uh, text messages here, email over here, the web over here, my to-do list over here. Well, the goggles allow you to do that in a ver in your environment. I could still see my keyboard, but now I can um, place those panels, big screens or whatever, in each wall. So if I walk to the next room, it'll remember what I put on the wall in the next room. This oh, that's wild. It's, it's like wild, but did you, you know, I don't know if you guys saw this, but people are driving. It says explicitly, do not drive with them. People are driving with them on. Your point on that, not, I mean, so you're very computer savvy. Think of how much that's going to help and how much we all know people that are just like, they always are, are asking for little local tech support, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, like take that different, like you don't have to find that app. You don't have to configure that app. It's just right. going to do that for you. It's going to make it so much use more usable. And I think it's going to help everyone, everything. Yeah, I think like, that, you know. Especially coming uh, from Apple. You know they're going to do it, make it very user-friendly, you know. Yeah, I, I'm very excited. I mean, there there are very, even the fact that it's watching you that closely um, is a little nerve-wracking. But I think there's a lot of positivity, Tony and Kara, coming out. Um mm -hmm specifically around the health and fitness area, like there's new um, organizations popping up. So they're like the traditional get health insurance and have that be your, your health plan and that process. There's new companies going to cash only and doing uh, wellness. And so you're not paying insurance, but they're like using AI to analyze what do you really need? Like, are you missing something in, in your diet or your exercise so I, I just see like That's where really the, cool. there, there is a negative aspect that, Hey, this AI is watching my heartbeat and, and everything else on the other side, it is uh, allowing us to analyze data from a health and regenerative perspective that I think is going to, I, I have a positive feeling that our lives are actually going to get better. And I, I know we mentioned behavioral science, uh, earlier today one of my my guests is a behavioral scientist super cool guy tony i think we'll have to do another uh, podcast where i get you two on this guy is absolutely incredible also right and he's doing some really cool things with ai but he posted a blog or he, he sent an email out about he he has one of the new apple visions and this is kind of the concern i had is that that apple vision pro when i tried the meta I got a little bit nauseous. There's some mm -hmm. delay or something that caused, and he's, he, it, he said he, in his email, he said it took him 90 minutes to recover. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. So there's a, there's a bit of a, like a learning mm -hmm. to start mm -hmm. to use it, but well, I do the see other it. Thing that's interesting about what you're saying is that makes security so much more important because you're going to have yeah. so many attributes of an individual stored now as data and it may already be stored that way that we're just not totally aware of but that puts things on hyperdrive you've really got to have strong security systems around all this data if that's what's where it's well, heading yeah i think so security and governance are going to be really critical components as we continue to press forward with what we can do right um or do you handle any of those kind of aspects with your with d2 uh, Tony, we we do on our IT side, and we you know security is really important. Uh, compliance, regulatory items, a, every industry, and and more and more, it's getting <clears throat> kind of cracked down as as it should be, right? Because the the bad, unfortunately, it's one of the one of the downsides of of every tool, and AI is just like it. It's going to be used by the evil doers. You know, they're gonna it's going to make them more efficient. It's going to make them more creative. So everything's got to step up on on the good guy side to to prevent that. And, and I think this, like you were talking about with healthcare, I mean, you go into the doctor, at least my experience, I go into the doctor, I spent most of the time in the waiting room. I see a nurse for a few minutes. The doctor comes in for maybe five minutes, maybe 10 total. And that's my yearly checkup. And I think wow. if, if he were to take my data and he were to know, like, here's what's been happening. He could look at it and not just look at it, but then have 
some AI bubble the stuff to the top to say, here's what here's what happens to him at night when he's asleep. Or what look at that, you know? Yeah. I mean, we gotta be within all HIPAA laws and, and guidelines and all that sort of stuff. But that those are all doable problems, I think, right? We can we can 100%. figure that out. But gathering that information and say, okay, now instead of seeing you for 10 minutes, asking me something where it's like, well, you know, I don't know when I do this, it kind of hurts. And then he just says, well, don't do that. You know, if you can <laughs> gather all that information and say, here's what's going on. Here's what we see yeah. is happening. For, and like, I love what you said. Move it beyond just sort of, this is the kind of data and this is the kind of, uh, the artificial intelligence can move us beyond correcting something that's wrong to say, how do we get as healthy as possible? Right. You know? And then, then our, our medical system don't have time for that today, right? It's like, ah, you're okay, get out of here, you know? Yeah, and what we're saying. Back to, that takes us back kind of to athletics too. You know, we look at these world-class athletes where, you know, what separates first and second is like, you know, millimeters of strength or, you know, just the tiniest little factor. Why can't we use AI to help figure out what that little bit is. How do we get to that next level with these top athletes and figure out, you know, I was a gymnast, what's the best angle to let go of the bar at? And how many seconds does it take after, you know, you swing to get hit that angle and timing everything to that most optimal measurement or, you know, the, the top, um, you know, we look at Simone Biles, and her, um, you know, frame, what about her frame allows her to get the height that she does and right. the speed that she does? And is that doable with other humans or is she truly so unique that nobody else will ever be able to achieve that, right? And figuring that out and decomposing what is, what is truly an, an optimal athlete or yeah. any kind of movement. Right. No, I, I think, um, so we all know that we have a really awesome Super Bowl coming up. I'm super happy my team's in it. Right. <laughs> but yeah, Carrie, you bring up a good point where athletes today, when they're recruiting, you can look at lots of stuff. Did you guys ever see the movie Moneyball? Mm -hmm. I just think that's a great thing, right? Because there's like, hey, we don't have to hit home runs. We got to get on base. I think there are lots of things that we can improve as humans in our workplace and also just in our daily lives that will, that you don't have to hit home runs to get the optimization that, that we want or would benefit us as human beings. Right. I, I definitely believe like, uh, I think the reason I was attracted to data and analytics was through what I, what I was watching, how I, I was coaching these athletes, how I could get just like a 5% increase in their strength or speed agility mm -hmm. or reduction in body fat from, you know, 18 down to 10. Like I can actually monitor that. And those kinds of things fascinated me. And we barely had the technology that we have today. I'm really looking forward to what uh, organizations like yours, Tony, and like Comer, what we can help people deliver so that they can get the absolute most out of um, their their workers. And this kind of going back to the balance being ultimately, how do we leverage all of this technology? to bring balance into our, into our lives as human beings. Right. Kara and I on, I, I interviewed Kara to just ask her, cause you know, she is a top performing consultant. It's like, how do you balance? Like, how do you, you know, is that, a, you know, is that, that's gotta be important to a mother. And these are the, the things I hope Tony, that we can help organization optimize so that we have better work life balance also. Um, there's so many different tools and opportunities that we can bring together uh, as we stay focused on, um, like my, I love the, this part about my job, which is to stay ahead of enough in terms of technology that I can bring it up in conversations with potential clients and say, Hey, would you want to, um, would you guys consider this? So my goal in interviewing you, Tony, is also to, to continue to ask, what are people out there looking for? What are people, um, 
you know, what messages can we give to these people that are embarking it? This is a, this for us, it's probably, and we're, we have a different background, but there's a lot of people that are going to listen to this that are like, you know, yeah, I work in an environment, but we don't, we, we don't know how we can really get started or deploy any of the cool stuff you guys are talking about. So yeah. we'll leave you know it with that. What's Go interesting ahead. about that question is I, and, and I, I, uh, I believe something that Steve Jobs said, and I don't, I'm not going to be able to quote him exactly. I'll get it wrong. But essentially okay. it was, I don't ask my customers what they want because they don't know what they want. What they want is what they see right now. And that's like the iPhone. He said, nobody would have ever asked for the iPhone. He said, so I, I think what, what, and the beauty of what our companies can do for people is not ask them like, Hey, what do you want AI to do? I'm going, I don't know, you know, uh, or they'll say something like right now I, I, I need to process this. But if we can help them understand their problems and we can help them understand their biggest opportunities and then apply, how can we help them apply this technology to that? That's when they're going to see that it, it, and, and they're not going to have the ability to do it. They need companies to help them create yeah. these models, kind of clean the data, bring it together and then run through the analysis and show them here's, here's what you need to do. I mean, you know, we've been doing data analysis and behavioral science for 20 years. So before AI, but it was, it was kind of modeling a similar sort of thing. And one of the things that we, we do best is we go into the back end of business. You know, businesses are saying, look at us, like we got great products. We're so popular and we're so profitable. And, and then I, I usually say to the guy, hey, what, what's your, uh, let's take a look at the back end of the business. Like what's your tech support call rate? What's your return rate? You know, and then you look at how much is leaking out and then like, oh my gosh, you know, think of like, you're going to sell a new product and it'll make, this many millions, you clean up this, you're talking like big companies, like a hundred million dollars. You know, they're like, whoa, let's go take a look at this now. I didn't even know what was going on back there because it's ugly and stinky. Nobody wants to pay attention <laughs> to that, right? It's yeah. not, you know, nobody, nobody's gonna, you know, the, the all the kudos go to the people that are creating great products and they're out there with marketing. And But I mm -hmm. think those are the kind of problems, the ugly things, it's like, you yeah, nobody wants to work on that. Let, let's go help make your business a lot better. And it's a perfect fit, I think, for, great data and, and then analysis. And of course, you know, AI on top of that. Absolutely. Kara, as we're wrapping up here, are there any questions that you have for Tony that we should have asked or give him the opportunity to speak about? Um, I get, uh, do you have any big new projects coming up that you're excited about? Um, I can't talk about those. What I can, <laughs> what I can tell you though, can you just we, tell did us? A, we did a study. <laughs> uh, we, we did a, a, a deep, study on, on chat GPT specifically. And we, we, instead of looking at it, we looked at it relative to what, a human, how would a consumer look at this? And, and one, so this is over a year ago, we, we ran this and, and then we took it out to kind of our, our favorite customers and talked to them about it a bit. One of the things that we saw over a year ago that now has been given a different name than what, what we called it is hallucination. Hallucination is happening in AI. And like, why is that? And what's gonna happen with that? And one of the simple things we did was we were just, we asked it, so we looked at all kinds of different efforts and personas and how would people wanna use this? Um, some it was really good at, like one, one of the things we saw is is language translations, it, it rocked. We were able wow. to take, cause we already had the translation done from a previous work. So we put the English in and we out, out came, you know, whatever, Spanish, whatever it was. And then we can compare it. It was it was really good, um, and because it's a model, it's very precise, right? One of the things that we saw, just a kind of a silly example, uh, one of our behavioral scientists lives in Vermilion, South Dakota. It's where the University of South Dakota is, and, and they have a, a behavioral science department. Um, he just asked it, like, tell me the best coffee shops in Vermilion, and so I'll spit all these answers. Some were right on the button. Some were places that they, they clearly missed, like it might, and we could tell, like it might have had the word like grind in there, but it was grind because it was some sort of like shop that would grind metal or something. So it, it got a whiff of something that might be coffee-like, but there were other things. It, it told us businesses that didn't exist. And not only didn't they, they never existed. It wasn't like, oh, they were around and they closed like five years ago. What? There was never a business like that ever. And and the, and the, and so this is something I think for people to be aware of with the hallucination is not only did it say that, 
you know, you, you, again, you go back to Google and you ask Google a question, like how come to the coffee shops? It'll give you, a, here's all this stuff. Just kind of, you just kind of pick and look and um, it gives back an answer and it gives it very confidently with authority typically because it's trying to give yeah. you an answer. Right. And so, so why, why am I saying this? Um, th there is this effect and they're still trying to figure it out. I mean, some people, I, we, I did a little post on, uh, on LinkedIn about it. I, I talked to, uh, one of the guys who's, he's the head of the, the AI fund and he was being interviewed with, uh, um, the, the person who's, who's the head of Stanford lab working on, on this AI stuff. It was, this is part at CES. Um, he, I asked him about hallucination. He kind of blew me off and, and it, it, but it was good. It was, it, it wasn't like disrespectful. It was like, yeah, stuff happens. You know, we're going to figure this out and it's really not that bad. Human brains hallucinate too. <laughs> but, but I think it's a, I think it's a bigger problem than that because human brains hallucinate, you know, like we all have friends and you'll, you'll talk to this friend. You'll say, okay, if I'm going to talk to, you know, Joe, if I talk to him about sports, I know he knows what he's talking about. You know, if I start to talk to him about cars, it's like, yeah, he doesn't know what he's talking about, you know, because you have experience with those people. Right. And, and, you know, there's, there's, I hate to say it, there's some people we know, like they're know-it-alls. They think they'll talk like they know everything about everything. So you got to kind of know that, well, no, I know they don't know stuff here. I got to check this. We don't know that with AI right now. We don't, we don't have, mm -hmm. it's like a personal relationship, but we don't have the experience. So why, so back to the, the idea that it's not going to be a standalone tool that's just going to spit out, here's the answer. It's going to take expertise to build the data. To, I mean, this has mm -hmm. to be built on good, clean, good data. voluminous data. If that, if you start with, without, without that, it, it's trouble. And I, I wonder if part of the hallucination effect isn't that it's trained on the internet. There's a lot of fiction out on the internet and it's okay. It's good. It's real fiction. It's good fiction. You know, it's, by the way, ask ChatGPT to write a fictional story. It's really good at that, you know. But but going back to try, trying to get to that truth, having good data, having good prompt engineering, and then on the output, don't take the answer as like, okay, there it is. It, now you need to dig in and say, what's right? What's wrong? What's off? And if we're building these models and talking to people about this, being able to have that analysis to be able to regress and fix it and, and make it better. So I think... I think all those things are opportunities for people. Yeah. And, and I, I don't think you should scare them off and say, oh, my gosh, you're going to give me a bad answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, your friends are going to give you bad answers, right? <laughs> but but yeah. you need to be able to know it and understand it and dig down deeper. I, it's a real effect. I'm not sure they understand it yet. I don't. I think there's there's something more going on here than is clearly understood by the, the fully, I should say, fully understood by the AI community. So, but again, yeah. it's not, it's not, 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 not to scare you off. That the prompt engineering is really cool. I mean, that could end up being an entire topic in itself I, as this grows, right? Like you're going to have classes on that. <laughs> if you study computer science in college, yeah, right? You're going to have think, a prompt engineering class probably to I, I think so. and then, how to best leverage these tools. Yes. And like you're, if it goes into different like local models, that mm -hmm. prompting has to be uh, knowledgeable about that local model, whether it's health or it's, it, it's your process optimization or, you know, what it, it can't just be knowledgeable about AI. It's got to be knowledgeable about the subject matter as well. Yes. The right, yeah, absolutely. I think that's going to be a big thing. Yeah, I think, Tony, we'll have to have you back on here to, to talk about prompt engineering and hallucinations. <laughs> but, no, uh, that this is all great stuff, Tony. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to come and just have a chat with us and just, you know, let us know what you're seeing out there. Really appreciate that. Um, oh, you're very I welcome. I, could... I thank you, both of you guys for inviting me on. I think this is a great opportunity to kind of continue to get the word out and, and show that this is, this is here. It, it's, it's not going to go away. People need right. to kind of figure out how they're going to fit in and use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, the other things, you know, we, we, we often, because we're in our phones or we're really busy, we don't have a lot of time to get together and just have a conversation to talk about what's going on around us. So I really appreciate just being able, I mean, this would have been great to be in person. I got to figure out how I can do some of these in person. I know like some of the big oh, podcasts. We'll go visit yeah, City, exactly. Iowa. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just sit down <laughs> in a room. I mean, because we could literally talk for hours with so much going on it was really fun tony it was great having you kara i really appreciate you introducing me to tony and i look forward to our our conversations our future conversations as 
as you run into more and more opportunities. I I, I really enjoyed it too. And I, I would look forward to, to doing this again. This is great. I appreciate it. Fantastic. That. Yeah. Well, thank you guys both very much. Um, Kara, thank you. And we'll look forward to seeing you all again real soon.